American women. I had even quit smoking. Yet there I was, banging a 21-year-old high school dropout on the floor of his recovery house bathroom. <laughs> a girlfriend asked why I didn't just bring him home. I don't want him to know where I live, I said, as if that should have been obvious to anyone. I mean, this kid had open court cases, if not open sores. <laughs> he had needle marks and lightning bolt tattoos on his arm. This was just not the sort of boy a nice Jewish girl brings home to home. I see you won't let him put his feet on your carpet, but you let him put his... She trailed off. I looked at her like the RCA Victor dog, popping my head to one side in bafflement. Why was I screwing a skinhead on a linoleum, I wondered. A few years and much self-searching later, I came to understand that I was a sex and love addict. That's why I was doing it, and I was as out of control in that area as I had been over cocaine, over alcohol, over food, over cigarettes, over everything in my life. So I decided to write a book about it. It says here, my goals when I began this book were pretty straightforward. One, explain what love addiction is. Two, let you decide if you're hooked on sex, romance, or relationship. Three, introduce you to some fellow travelers. Yeah. <laughs> Four, provide tools to help you extricate yourself from your misery. Five, make you laugh. Because if you are a love addict, God knows you've cried enough already. <laughs> To accomplish these five seemingly simple tasks, I schooled myself on the diagnosis and treatment of addiction, cultural attitudes on sex through the ages, basic neurology and biochemistry, and the box office receipts for bad romantic comedies. I listened to the personal stories of hundreds of sex and love addicts. I consulted experts from Florida to California. The result is here. So, my pet name, for love addiction, makes me thirsty. No. <laughs> Everything makes me thirsty. Everything makes me hungry. <laughs> My pet name for love addiction is affection deficit disorder. I crave affection. I yearn for affection. I long for affection. I can never seem to get enough affection. Interestingly, I have the same problem with appetizers. <laughs> Sit me in front of a nice buffet and I can eat for a week. The mechanism that signals the brain, no more, thanks, I'm fine, doesn't function properly in my brain. I'm never fine. I always need more. Now, like any other psychiatric disorder, love addiction has both symptoms, subjective, what you feel, and signs, objective, what others notice. That buzzing in your ears and red haze in front of your eyes when you see the guy you like drinking sake with another woman, that's a symptom. <laughs> Immediately throwing up your sushi is a sign. <laughs> Running outside and slashing her tires is a felony. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you feel a crippling surge of adrenaline when you pass by your ex-lover's house, you are probably normal. If you feel a crippling surge of adrenaline when you drive by any house painted a similar color, <laughs> you may have a problem. If you glimpse a pretty girl across a crowded room, get an instant erection, and announce, I have found the mother of my children, you are, if you are a heterosexual male, probably normal. If you have seen, felt, and announced the same thing a dozen times or more, you may have a problem. We love addicts are rarely the wife who wonders why her husband complains that she's a backseat driver. We're more likely to be the mistress who wonders what it would be like to drive her car through her married lover's living room window. <laughs> so, uh, let me see. Um, shall I give you a little self-test? Does anyone want to do a little yeah. self-test? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Here are a few telltale signs of love addiction, with all apologies to Jeff Foxworthy. You might be a sex or love addict if you check your crush's daily horoscope in the morning along with your own. <laughs> Extra points for checking theirs first. <laughs> Ditto for their Facebook page. <laughs> you leave a second or third or fourth voicemail message before the first message is returned just in case A, she didn't hear it properly, or B, he's shy and needs encouragement, <laughs> or C, maybe you dialed wrong, or D, maybe you forgot to leave a callback number, or E, maybe she called and you missed it, or pick a letter, I've got a whole alphabet. <laughs> You changed your route home to pass your love object's house. Extra points for parking outside and waiting. 
Standing across the street counts if you live in New York City. Extra points for standing in the rain. You can develop an instant fondness for a hobby or musical genre you found abhorrent only days earlier. <laughs> you know your lover's email password or voicemail password. You have read your lover's email or listened to their voicemail. You have read your lover's journal. Extra points if you flip through it first looking for your name. <laughs> you have checked your lover's underwear. Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> it hurts a little when you learn that an attractive person, any attractive person, even a person you don't actually know, has gotten married or engaged to someone who is not you. <laughs> you work in a job that requires partial nudity. <laughs> You rearrange your desk so your co-workers can't see what's on your monitor. <laughs> your life list of sex partners is in the three figures. Four rock stars and professional athletes make that four figures. <laughs> you keep a life list of sex partners. The only phone numbers you know by heart are your mother, your latest crush, and your psychic. Mother is optional. You really believe that you can save that stripper, convict, biker, serial philanderer, suicide survivor, with the depth and purity of your love. Uh, let me see. Okay. Other ways to know if you might possibly be a love addict. Tell me if you've ever felt this way. You're curled up on the couch in a fetal position waiting for him to call. Nothing else in the world matters, nothing. The void inside you is so big you could crawl into it. You have no appetite, but it doesn't matter because you can't taste anything anyway, except maybe sugar and salt. You relive past conversations in your head, revising and rewording them over and over. You weep at random intervals. You can't fall asleep. When you finally do fall asleep, you can't stay asleep. Then you can't get out of bed. When you finally do get up, you reread some old emails or listen to some old voicemails, or both. It's calming a little to hear that voice. You write an email you will never send, revising and rewording it over and over. You weep at random intervals. The phone rings and you leap for it like it's a pot boiling over on the stove. The anticipation makes your whole body quiver. If it is him, the euphoria feels like pink champagne tickling your nose. Your voice goes up a register. If it isn't him, the disappointment weighs like lead. You go back to the couch. You weep at random intervals. <laughs> if you do go out, which happens less and less often, your heart lurches into your throat every time you see a car, the same make and model as his car, or a similar make and model, or the same color. <laughs> you imagine he's about to walk out of every doorway, about to turn every corner. You look at every girl on the sidewalk and imagine he's going out with her. You weep at random intervals. <laughs> no, I haven't been reading your journal, I'm reading mine. I have felt that way about dozens of men, felt as if this, this was the one I was waiting for, the one who would complete me. This was my soulmate, the love of my life. This was the man whose affection was as vital to me as air or water, men whose kisses melted me into marshmallow cream, whose touch made me quiver. Men who I was sure would love me on the same cosmic, infinite level that I already loved them if they would only stay a little longer. Men whose names I no longer associate with their faces. It wasn't about the men, it was about me. I'm addicted to love and like any addict, I suffer withdrawal when my drug is taken away. The only difference between love withdrawal and heroin withdrawal is the soundtrack. Most junkies don't play Leonard Cohen songs. <laughs> okay, I'll just do one more, one more piece, and then I'll turn it over to some of the other people whose stories are in the book. It says, <clears throat> whether or not you believe love addiction is a disease, God knows it hurts. It makes your hair ache and your feet cry. It hurts with a longing so deep and pervasive that just the sound of that voice eases a pain you didn't realize was there all along. It hurts with a craving for physical release that twists your stomach into knots and makes your eyeballs throb. Left untreated, it can be fatal. That's right, love addiction can kill you. Maybe you'll get HIV AIDS because you couldn't find it within yourself to insist that he wear a condom. Maybe you'll be beaten to death because you won't leave him or shot to death because he won't let you leave. 
You might drown your sorrows in booze and die in a car crash or anesthetize them with sleeping pills and die in a house fire. Perhaps you'll commit suicide because you just can't stand the pain one more day. I know many who have attempted it and a few who have succeeded. The pain of untreated love addiction becomes so unbearable that we do anything and everything to get numb. People use food, booze, pills, television, gambling, fast cars, loud, loud music, long naps. After a while, you're so numb the only, that only the very wild sex and dangerous passions that got you into trouble in the first place are strong enough to get through the haze. You end up right back in the vicious cycle of behavior that made you miserable, so you try to get more numb. The truly tragic part is that past a certain point, the only thing powerful enough to get through the cotton wool is the very pain that made you want to numb out in the first place. my own nattering on and a lot of scientists and experts and actual real data and information here are some of the personal stories of people who relate to this and a few of them are uh, kind enough to be here today and read a little bit of their own experience and so I'm going to um, ask um, John to come and read a little bit of his experience and then I'm going to have uh, Mona read a little of hers and then I'm going to ask you 